So what an entry point is, is a particular kind of way that a, a, a person uses to begin to order these overdetermined sites to begin to make sense of them. And of course there are many, many, many different entry points, that is many, many different theories deploying these different ideas to make sense of, of, of society. And these different entry points then distinguish, they identify the different ways, the different theories that we use to make sense of society. As Marx uses class, that's an economic process to begin to make sense of society. That's his particular entry point, and that's to be compared and contrasted with the other entry points that people use. So that's the first idea. Second, let me go back to, I'm going to erase this mess that is society to go back and talk about the following. We have society as this kind of site of politics, economics, culture, and nature, and so forth, etc. So everything comes together to produce this, this dot, this society that we just did. All of these determinations are different. These political, economic, these cultural, and of course these natural. They're all different. So society is the result of these different determinations, and we can use another word to capture this. Society exists in contradiction, and what contradiction refers to here is the different pushes and pulls that are present in society resulting from all of these different processes. So the result of overdetermination of how something exists is the, or I should say, are the contradictions present in that particular uh, um, entity, whatever it is. Let me give you a different example of this. Something that may be relevant um, to your lives right now. How do you explain the particular choices of an individual for taking one course over another at the university? Well, I'm examining now an individual, you or me, that makes a choice to take a particular course. We're pushed in the direction of taking this course as a result of all kinds of open and hidden uh, parental pressures. So that's a set of determinations that operate on us whether we're aware of them or not. It's what our parents want us to do and have wanted us to do from the, from the time that we were born. But that's not all. Then there are cultural determinations that push us to take a particular course as a result of all kinds of, uh, of, of ideas and experiences of what is and what is not popular in a society at a, any moment in time. But that's not all. The courses that we take are also a result, complex result, of the rules and regulations of the university, as well as who's teaching that courses, who's a popular teacher, who's not, and so forth. Also, the economy shapes us in all kinds of ways in terms of the courses that we take because of the vague ideas we have that if we take a particular uh, course that may help us uh, uh, get a job um, when, we gr when we graduate um, so that we can uh, you know, do well in the future. But these same forces also push us in a different direction. We resist and we rebe rebel again against parental pressures. We struggle against university rules. We always are responding to our changing views and experience of what subjects seem to interest us and what subjects do not. We refuse to become prisoners of an unknowable future. In other words, we're conflicted. We take course, we, we make a choice, we have a desire to take a course, but at the same time we don't want to take that particular course. And the result of all of these determinate, we exist in contradiction. And as a result of that, those contradictory forces upon us, we take a particular action. We make a particular choice. In other words, the contradictions yield our behaviors, what we do and what we don't do, what courses we enroll in and what we don't enroll in. And you can apply this kind of logic to all of our choices 
um, over our entire lifetime. So the, putting it all together, the society is both a result of these different determinations, but the society also comes back and shapes all of these. So there is a mutual interaction between society and its political, economic, and cultural, uh, and of course natural uh, processes. It's just like there's a mutual interaction between us and our parents and uh, the professors and the courses that we take and so forth, etc. They shape us and we shape, we shape them. And, and again, to go back to, to, to make sure we understand, in this mutual effectivity, an entry point plays the role of beginning to try and understand, to explain this complex mutual effectivity. That's why it's, it's so important in the theories that we deploy. Next step in this. The notion of overdetermination means that the influence of any entity upon any other is itself constituted. Let me give you just a concrete example of this because this point is, is rather important. I'm going to take something that's uh, uh, popular today. It may not, it, this may not be in the news <laughs> when you hear these lectures, but let me just take something today. We have a, um, let me take three events. We have something today called the crisis in Egypt. As I talked to you today, this has been in the news for the last couple of weeks. Okay, so that's the crisis, in the U and I'll call that event C. Now, event A, right now, seems to be the most important cause on the crisis in Egypt, which event A is the lack of democracy in Egypt. If you hear the news, you read the papers, invariably there is, this is the most important cause in the crisis in Egypt. Okay? And other causes which, which are there are thought to be secondary. Let me take B. Uh, the uh, unequal distribution of income in that country. Okay. Now let's go back to overdetermination because see if this is the you know, see if we understand what it is. This is a good example to test that. Overdetermination is saying the crisis in Egypt is a site of determinations, fascinating and interesting and so forth. And from the perspective of the notion of overdetermination, th those, those uh, influences are infinite in character. There's no question that the lack of democracy has had an impact on that crisis. But the influence of A on C, this heavy line here, from the perspective of overdetermination, is itself a complex, complex product of B and C and a whole other e bunch of events that have yet to be examined. In other words, this causation itself is not independent of how B impacts C. And let me, you know, let me take another one right, right over here. Let me put uh, D. This would be the class structure in Egypt the Marxian contribution. This too complexly affects A and hence how A is constituted creates literally its impact upon C. So this arrow here, what we think is more important, what we think has this bigger you know, quantitative and or qualitative impact upon C is itself a product of how B and D and E and F and G and so forth created. So this is not independent of these other causations. Put on, you know, it, it, by the way, nor is the class structure independent of this lack of freedom 
or is the income distribution a product? They complex, they mutually constitute one another. So this kind of idea, in a sense, demotes what we think is important today. Once we understand that that which is important today, that in impact, that effectivity, is itself caused. Okay, so. The impact of democ or the lack of democracy on Egypt is itself caused by the unequal distribution of income, the class structure in, in Egypt, and a whole bunch of other kinds of, of cultural and natural and political processes um, that other theorists are going to introduce, because that's what theory does. It's continually discovering new kinds of, of uh, uh, determinations in the world and once we discover them, we understand that that which we thought was important today gets demoted by these new kinds of, of processes that the theorists introduce with their different kinds of points of entry. So the upshot of all of this is that entities, no matter what they are, in this case A, B, C, and D, are not independent of one another. That's what overdetermination means. Okay. That, that independent entities can't exist. Why? Because each is the site of determinations emanating from all the others. And what is true for any one is true of them all. So they only exist as they literally constitute one another. They only exist in relationship to one another. If that's the case, then they can't be causally ordered to say that one is more important or less important or of equal importance. To say that one is more or less or equal importance to the other presumes independence so that you can causally order them. If they are not independent, you can't do that. The implication of this is that there are no, from the perspective of, of overdetermination, there are no essences in the world. No process in the world is immune from causation, because that's what an essence is. An essence is something, it's like a god. As an essence is immune from causation. It, it reproduces itself. From the perspective of overdetermination, there are no essences in the world. And again, that's because things only exist in relationship to other things. Everything is both cause and effect, and an effect. So, overdetermination is an anti-essentialist approach to theory, whether that theory be in epistemology or in society. We've already discussed the anti-essentialist perspective of overdetermination in terms of rationalism and empiricism. But you can see that the anti-essentialist approach is also arguing there's no ultimate uh, most important determining factor in a society like the crisis in Egypt. However, within Marxism, within the tradition, there is a kind of theoretical essentialism, which is very, very important, and I want to spend one moment on it because it's in your reading and it's, in, it's, it's unfortunately in Marx's uh, text as well. And it's called economic determinism. So let me just spend a moment on that because it's so important. <clears throat> 